praise the Lord. Just wanted to uh, read scripture today, and then we'll have prayer and take our seat. Uh, Psalm 139, verse 17 through 18. Uh, Brother Darren, uh, can we get the entire Psalm 139? Can you just pull that up for me? But this is the part that I want to uh, emphasize today. We are going to read Psalm 139. Beautiful, beautiful psalm. And maybe if every day of your life, you take five minutes out in the morning, less than five minutes, something to take two minutes, to read once Psalm 139. I'm sure it will make a tremendous difference to your life. It will make a tremendous difference to your self-esteem, to your sense of worth, to your confidence. It will make a massive difference. And I want us to read it. Let's read it like the way we read, read this morning. Make you, make you. So on. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. You have hedged me behind and before, and laid your hand upon me. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I take the wings of the morning, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O oh God! How great is the sum of them! For they speak against you wickedly, your enemies take your name in vain. No, we jump in. We'll stop it. Father, we thank you. We thank you today for your wonderful presence in this house. We thank you, God, that you're always going before us. And so even as we came to church today, we came into your presence. And so, God, we are so delighted to know that you precede us because you have something special for us. And we thank you, God, that there is a special gift to be distributed to each and every person today. You know exactly where we are in our journey, in our walk. You know what are the obstacles in our way. You know what are the questions, the fears, and the anxieties that consume us, that stall us at times. And oh God, this morning I ask in the name of Jesus that you will have your way. Spirit of the living God, we recognize that it is you who will convey the thoughts of God to each and every heart. And so, Lord God, at this time I step aside, I decrease and allow you to increase. That your words might be heard, that your thoughts might be made clear to each and every heart. I pray that you will grant direction to each and every person today, that you will grant a word that is needed in this season of their lives. Have your way today, bless us, and when we leave this place, we will not be ungrateful, but we will give thanks.
thanks and praise to you for knowing us, for being concerned about us enough to speak a word to our particular situation. In Jesus' name, to all the glory. Praise the Lord. As I said, this is a, a beautiful, really beautiful psalm. And <clears throat> at the end of it, the part where I said, let's stop at that point. The last part was David basically saying, you know, God, uh, just uh, get rid of those who hate you uh, because you are so wonderful. As he talks about in this psalm, you're so wonderful, the great things that you do for us. How is it that men could reject you and how men could treat you this way? That, you know, so he, he just came to a place of abhorrence in the end and it was just uh, asking God to. So we just left that part out. This is the part of I really want to concentrate on a little bit. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. The when I Go to bed, I get up in the morning, I open my eyes. I'm still with you, consumed with you, because you are consumed. I pray. And I just label this talk that I want to share with you this morning, God's obsession. God's obsession. An obsession is a state of being obsessed with someone, or something, or an idea, or a thought. If I'm constantly thinking about something, I'm obsessed with it. And that obsession often finds its, its way into me as soon as I'm not distracted. The moment I find myself in that place of ease, I think again about it. It's an obsession. It's, it's something that possesses me. This is what an obsession is. And I titled this message God's Obsession because from this verse, I recognize that God is obsessed. He's obsessed. He's, he's thinking always about us. How precious, look at these words, how precious are your thoughts, that how great is the sum of them, that God is always thinking about us. Now, I began to think about this, and I said, you know, there are people in my life that I love, and there are people I can call any one of you, who are married or who have children, and, and ask you, you know, uh, about the person you love, and ask you to tell me a few things that occupy your mind about the person you love. If I were to call Stephanie and say, I'm sure you love your baby, Emma, what are the thoughts that occupy your mind about your child? You probably say, well, she's so cute, she is so interesting, she's loving. You, you have thoughts that occupy your mind. You ask me what occupies my, my mind about my wife, or I ask you what are the thoughts that occupy your mind about the person you love. You are likely to be able to say, okay, you know, there are a few things that I think about. Wives, if I ask you about your husband, what is it that you occup that occupy your mind about your husband? You'll probably say, well, you know, I think about what a fortunate person I have, I am to have a good husband, a hard-working husband, someone who loves me, someone who loves his family. And so you count up the thoughts. But how many thoughts, realistically, can we come up with that occupy our minds, even about the person that we are most consumed with? Or the thing that we are most consumed with? How many thoughts can we actually list up to say, I'm obsessed with this individual, or obsessed with this project, or obsessed with this idea, how many thoughts can I list down on a sheet of paper as to what that, the nature of that obsession is? And I began to think about this thing this week as I meditated on this, on this message as I'm working on it. And I said, here is Almighty God. And Almighty God is thinking about me. And he's so obsessed, the thoughts of God towards me and you are so many that the psalmist said, if I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand on the seashores. 
that this great big God is thinking about me. And there are two things about the thoughts he's thinking about me. One is there are precious thoughts. How precious, how great, how precious are your thoughts, Lord? So it's not thoughts that of judgment. They are not thoughts about, oh, I wish I could just take him out. They are not thoughts about bad things. They are not thoughts about regret and sorrow and repentance. They are precious thoughts. These are precious thoughts that God is having about me, about you. And not one thought, not two precious thoughts, not ten precious thoughts. Thoughts, but as many as the sand of the sea. David said, if I should count them, who would dare even imagine how many great grains of sand there are on the shores of, of the, the seas of this world, or the shores around the oceans of this world. And he's saying by inspiration of the Spirit that the thoughts of God towards you are not only precious, but they are on Countable, innumerable. They cannot be measured. You sit there and you think, what is God thinking about? About you, about me, that is so precious that you cannot count them. And it blows the mind. For me, it draws me to that place of reciprocal love and thinking about God. And I'll come back to this at the end. But the thoughts of God. What is he thinking about? About you? About me? What are some of these precious thoughts? As I read the 139th Psalm, I, I was able to glean from it some of the things that David is thinking about, that the Holy Spirit is revealing to him about what some of those thoughts are. What, what is God thinking about? What are some of the great thoughts that God has transmitted? You see, here is the thing. God is omniscient. God has these innumerable thoughts about us. They are precious and, and you can't number them. He has those thoughts about us. But God doesn't have those thoughts and want to keep them only in his head. God wants to us to understand what he's thinking about us. It serves no good if I have so many wonderful thoughts about my wife that she doesn't know. And so it serves no purpose at all for God to have all these precious thoughts, this uncountable number of thoughts about me, and I don't know about them. How What good will it serve me? Why is the Holy Spirit in the first place even telling me this? If it is not possible for me to know what God is thinking about. The idea of God thinking about me is so that I will be encouraged to understand what God is thinking about and realize those thoughts. There must be a convergence. When I understand, when I get to that place of understanding the thoughts of God towards me, when there is a convergence in my understanding, in my thinking about God, my thoughts of God, and God's thoughts of me come to a convergence, that's when I begin to realize and appropriate those blessings and actualize them in my own life. Otherwise, they remain in the mind of God. It serves me no purpose. But by saying that God has these precious thoughts and this innumerable amount of thoughts, good thoughts from you and me. It is an encouragement for us to access the mind of God. And how can we do that? How are we able to access the mind of God? We have the resource. The Holy Spirit bears witness in heaven. The Holy Spirit lives in our hearts. And this is why the entire New Testament encourage us and moves us and incites us to walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit, to move and operate in the fullness of the Spirit, to cultivate a life in the Spirit. Because when we move in the Spirit, the Spirit will enlighten our minds 
to understand the thoughts of God towards us. There will be congruence. There will be a, an intersection of thoughts where now I'm at that place to understand what God is thinking about me and it will transform my life. Great are these thoughts. If, if my, if on the way home, driving from church, my wife would turn to me and say, I have something wonderful to tell you. I would say, yeah, what is it? I'm excited. I want to hear. And then she says, no, don't bother. You know that experience, right? You will not rest. You want to know what is in her mind. It's better she hadn't said that. But now that she said, there is something I have to tell you, but no, don't go by. Now it creates the desire in me. I will not be at rest and at peace until I know what she's thinking. And this is what should happen to us. This is what should happen to each and every one of us. To know that the Almighty God is having wonderful thoughts about me. Precious thoughts. So many of them should move me to say, no, I am not going to rest. I cannot rest. I can no longer be in that state of passivity until I understand what are you thinking about? What are you thinking about? That is so precious. I want to know. Because when we understand but the precious thoughts of God towards us, you can You can be saved. And so this is an encouragement to discover the thoughts of God. But David gives us a few things, and I, I want to quickly look at some of them. Look at some of these. One is that we are the deliberate product of his hand. You form. You formed it. This destroys not only theories of evolution, where we are the product of some chance. No, you formed it. I'm not just a product of two people coming together. Years ago, we saw Cosby show, and he was upset with his son, Theo. And he said, boy, let me tell you something. I brought you into this world, and I can take you out. Well, Cosby thought he brought his son into the world, and many people think that they brought, they're the ones who bring the children into the world. But God is taking us beyond this. God is saying, I formed you. I formed you. When we understand this, it is bound to impact our self-esteem, our sense of worth. Many people are are, you know, have lost their potential. Many people are never amount to what they ought to be because they limit their being into this world, their existence to two people and whether those people care for them or not. But when we go beyond that, when we listen to God say, I formed you, it takes us beyond accidents. Most people say, oh, well, that child was an accident. We didn't plan that child. No. This is taking us beyond accidents. It is taking us beyond your biological parents. God is saying, it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what your parents say. It doesn't matter. The day you were born, I was the one who formed you. Life was given to you by me. And if this truth gets a hold of us, we will not be stymied by all the things, the baggage that so many of us carry about our parents not liking us or this person not liking us or we were, we are here by accident and God is saying, I formed you. And that should radicalize our sense of self, our sense of who we are. It should take our vision beyond and above our earthly parents and about all the philosophies of the world. We are here because of God. He formed us. And David began by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to say, 
that formation began long before your parents knew what I looked like or had a sonogram to get a sense of anything. You formed me in my mother's womb and you knitted me, my inward parts. But no one knew what was happening. You were already at work in my life. Beautiful thought. A life transforming thought if it gets a hold of us. We're not going to live in that state of self-pity and of the hand that was dealt to me was bad or I did not grow with a silver spoon or there were the opportunities of life or this or that. God formed me. God has a plan for my life. And if there's a boost to self-esteem, there it is. I'm the product of God. And God makes everything good. A perfect person cannot make anything that is imperfect. That's an impossible antithesis. Can't happen. God is perfect. Nothing that flows from him can be imperfect. I was, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm praise you. Marvelous are your works. And if, if, if we are fearfully made, and I'm wonderfully made, and God is marvelous in all his works, then I'm marvelous. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I'm marvelous because God cannot make anything that is not marvelous. Turn to somebody next to you and say, look at me. I'm marvelous. Go on, go on, do it. I'm marvelous. Amen. The third thought he said that that's communicated to him about what God is thinking of and this obsession of God that he's got. He knows everything about us. He knows everything about us. Think about this. Your husband or wife does not know everything about you. They don't. 30 years into marriage, you look at your spouse and say, wow, I never knew that. New things are being discovered all the time about each other. And I can't imagine what kind of a love is this. No wonder John says, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Does your spouse think about when you get up in the morning and when you sit down? Do they care to know? Do they care to know about when you go to bed, when you get up in the morning, when you go out, when you come in? How many spouses, how many people who care for each other track those small Details about each other. They don't care. Most guys don't remember what their wives wore yesterday. Ladies, test your husbands. Ask them what you wore to work yesterday. What color dress? And then say, lie, I wore jeans. We don't worry. We don't care about especially things we deem are not that important. And yet this God knows the moment I get up in the morning. He knows when I sit down. He knows the number here on my head. He knows every small detail that none of us pay attention to each other or about ourselves. Shows the intricate interest that God has in us. Has in me. Has in you. These are thoughts that David is saying. These things I can't fathom. I cannot attain to them. I can't process this kind of thing. Prime Minister of this country, does he know any of us? He will spend maybe how many years and, and he will have any idea we exist. But the greatest person in the universe knows when I get up, when I sit down, what I eat, what I wear, knows everything about me. He put back. So you know it, Lord, all together. All my ways, all everything I'm going to say, you know it all. This is love. 
This is interest. These are thoughts too hard for us to have. You protect us. You protect us. You hedge me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. God has hedged us in before and behind. And when he wrote this, I suspect he's thinking about how when the Hebrews came out of Egypt, how God protected them. He, he led them. And when Pharaoh came up from behind them, the fire that was in front of them moved to the back. David was probably thinking of Job as well. When the devil went up to God and said, Oh, your only blessing, Job is only serving you because you've made him wealthy. But if you were to remove, this is the devil telling God, if you were to remove that hedge that is around him and allow me to do my work upon him, see if he will serve you after. The point I'm trying to make is that even the devil saw that there was a hedge around you. You and I do not have that vision we don't see into the spirit realm. But it is a hedge. The Bible says we are kept by the power of God. There's a hedge about us. The angel of the Lord encamp around them that fear him and delivers them. God has put a hedge. You're important. You watch the president of America or the prime minister of Canada. They go about places and you see an entourage. And you say, wow, they're important. Look, they've got secret service people following them and protecting them. You know, even if they go jogging, you see two bodyguards running behind them. You know, wherever they go, they have a guard. And we look at them and we say, wow, they're important. They're so special. They're so lucky. It is because we don't understand our own position, our own state, who we are in Christ. The angel of the Lord encamp around them that fear him. You're walking with God. You're now walking alone. You are hedged in from before and behind by the presence of God. God has assigned angels to us. Hebrews tells us they are ministering spirits sent forth to them who are heirs of salvation. Yeah, if our eyes are open, we will see how important we are. And wherever we go, there is an angelic escort protecting us, moving with us. That's why I said to you at the beginning, if you were to read the psalm every day, when you get up and pray, you read the psalm, meditate upon it, your life cannot be the same. You will walk out of your house with confidence. You will walk out of your house. You will drive out of your house. You will jump in your car. And you will see in the spirit that angelic escort taking you along, following you. The siren, spiritual sirens blaring. You are important. You are, God is watching you. He's timing you. He's being with you. He's, he's assuring you that I made you. I'll keep you. Your life cannot be the same. Our lives cannot be the same. Our outlook, when we get to our workplace, we sit at our desk, we will not feel like just an employee. But someone, the destiny, who can change things around us and cause you a child. It is always present with you. Always present. God of the universe. Always present with you. Wherever I go. And many times we feel like when we mess up, God has left us. David is saying, even if I make my bed in hell. And lots of us do that. We've made, you know, we say, well, the bed you make, you lie on in life is what you made. And many people say, well, that's, that's the bed you made. You made some bad decisions in life and that's what it is. And you're kind of left on your own to figure things out. David is saying, even if I make my bed in hell, if I mess up so bad in life, make so many wrong decisions that get me in such a bad situation, you are still with me. You're not like those who abandon me when I make mistakes and I get myself in a mess. 
you're still he can't fight up. These, these are the thoughts, some of the things he's thinking about. That how is it that God, what kind of thoughts God has in his mind? Why is God so obsessed? What are some of these thoughts of God that that that, that are so precious and numerous? You are happy, your hand will lead me out. You're not wherever you are, even if it's a situation you got yourself in. Bad situation. The Lord is with you. And by his hand. Your right hand. You know I like the right hand. Who's sitting at the right hand of God? Who's sitting at the right hand of God? See how many times you come across that in scripture. Your right hand is going to lead me out. Jesus is going to take you. He's going to bring you out. Doesn't matter whether you create that situation for yourself. Doesn't matter. This is why it, there are thoughts that he said, I can't attain to them. Because in this life, you and I can understand when people do something good for us after we have done good for them. We can't understand when we do something bad to someone and they return good to us. But this is what he's saying, even if I make my bed in hell, Jesus will come. But, you know, as I think about this, I, as I think about what kind of thoughts that God could be having about me, about you, that is so, that are so precious and innumerable, the idea of, of so many thoughts, it occurred to me that these Thoughts cannot be limited just to our earthly existence. They cannot be limited to just this existence. As I said earlier, how many thoughts can you have of someone who more the dearest person to you, the person you love the most? Think about how many thoughts. Take an exercise book, write down how many good thoughts, precious thoughts you can have. You probably are not going to have more than a page of things that you can think that are good thoughts, precious thoughts about them. Your imaginative, maybe two pages. So, how is it that God could have all these thoughts about me that are more than the sands of the sea, the seashores? Evidently, these thoughts are not just limited to my present existence, but they go into my heart. The plans God, when God made you and I, it's not just that He's thinking about. 60, 70, 80 years old. No. This is less than a tip of the iceberg. We are going to be with Jesus for the endless ages. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that God has raised us up and made us to sit together with Christ in the heavenly, in heavenly places. That in what? That in the ages to come, He will show us the exceeding riches in, his, in the kindness of His grace towards us. That in what? In the ages to come. This entire life that we live in, this entire world from Adam to now is just one age. There were ages before this one. The ages in which demons were created or angels were created and beings were created that fell and became demons. And who knows how many ages before that? We don't know. There are going to be ages after this one. And so the thoughts of God are not just about my present. If I have enough food in my cupboard today. or if No. God is thinking about the ages to come. That we will be with him forevermore. And all of the plans that he has for us. And so this is what Jeremiah says. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Says the Lord. Thoughts of peace. And not of evil. To give you a future. To give you a future. You as parents. You're thinking about your children. And you think about their future. To give them a future. You're thinking about creating a future for your children. It is the same with God. He's thinking about us as his children. Not just for today. But for the ages. To give us a future. 
we will not be able to plumb the depths of the mind of God to extricate all of the thoughts that are more than the sand of the sea. But David has given us a few skeletons. Because God has all these wonderful thoughts. So, let me close with this. There is a disconnect between God and us. And the disconnect comes by virtue of God being omniscient and we being finite, limited creatures. So God has all these massive, precious, and innumerable thoughts about me. But I'm limited in intelligence to process the thoughts, to understand the thoughts that God has in me. To bridge that disconnect, God has given us the Holy Spirit. This is one of the reasons why we have the Holy Spirit. It is to bridge that divide between the infinite and the finite, the omniscient and those limited in knowledge. When we move in the fullness of the Spirit, we now have the ability to access the mind of God, to pull down those precious thoughts of God. And when we receive them into our spirits, our lives are changed. Our lives are transformed. Take these few thoughts that David, that David pulled down from the mind of God through the Spirit and released to us about the fact that we are formed by the hand of God. About fact that God is always with us. He knows everything about every intricate detail about our lives. And think about it. As you process them, they're transforming you. They're building your self-esteem, your sense of worth. They're enlarging your borders. Think about them. And imagine the more of the thoughts of God that come into our lives. The greater, the higher, the wiser we become. Amen. The more we realize eternal life. I've said to you, and I close here, I've said to you on a number of occasions, eternal life is not about flying around in heaven for the rest of eternity or playing hearts. That's not eternal life. You'll get bored doing that. Trust me. A lot of people look forward to retirement and say, I can't wait to retire. I can't wait to retire. And they retire and then Three months later, they sit in the house looking at their wives and say, well, this is not what we thought it would be. And next thing you see them back out looking for jobs somewhere. We are not made just to, to fly around in heaven for the rest of eternity. That's not eternal life. If that's what it is, a lot of people say, let me come back down to earth. Eternal life is knowing God. This is eternal life, John says, that you know God and Jesus Christ, the one whom he has made. Eternal life is knowledge of God. And as we grow into knowledge of God, as we access the thoughts of God and are transformed by those thoughts, we are, we are realizing eternal life. This is why it's called eternal life. It will take an eternity for us to arrive there. God is so vast. God is life and God is eternal. So God is eternal life. And for us to realize eternal life, that's why it begins now. The Bible says now we have eternal life. It starts now. But we realize it more and more. More and more. And it will take all of eternity for us to appropriate. But we can start realizing that eternal life now by more and more by accessing the thoughts of God. And so unless we are prepared to spend time in prayer, unless we are prepared to spend time to be filled with the Spirit, that Spirit is the only agency that can make those precious and innumerable thoughts known to us. You are not prepared to spend time in prayer 
and cultivate a walk and a life in the spirit, you will never know the thoughts of God. They'll be locked up in his head, and that's where they will bring it. And as long as they remain alone in God's head, they cannot transform us. You are transformed by the revelation of knowledge that we're giving you today. The more of God's thoughts that I know, the more of